must say I feel a little bit out of place at this event at um, Big, big Ideas Fest. I'm, I'm not sure that I've ever had a big idea in my life, really. Um, but I'm going to try and just put a few small ideas together in 15 minutes, and I hope that that counts as, as like a big idea. Um, if you can also get the slides up. Um, one of the um, reasons maybe or, uh, that I'm here is, um, in, in my group we do both stuff around music as well as around learning. And I think many of you know that in the world of music, um, probably innovation has been a little bit faster and a little bit more dramatic over the last few years than it has been in the world of learning. Okay. And um, so I think many of you will remember the, about 10 years ago when, when Napster started and the industry got rather frightened um, and a lot of things had to adapt, um, like now my laptop apparently needs to adapt. Um, and the, I'm going to try and talk you through some of the parallels that I see between what happened then in music, what we are now doing in the world of music, and how something similar could happen, and I believe will happen, and I'm absolutely convinced should happen in learning, apart from in presentation technology. <laughs> um, so the first few slides I was going to show you, if I had them, uh, would show you some of the uh, examples that you probably know from music, like um, whom amongst you knows things like Pandora? And you know what I'm talking about? Last of them, okay? You know what I'm talking about, uh, obviously. And um, try to think about why we need such applications. Uh, when I was 18 year old, when most of you were like 25 year olds maybe, um, I think the way we interacted with music, yeah, even better. And the way we interacted with music was very different from now because music at that moment was difficult to get to, remember? If you wanted to hear a song, you had to you know, put the black vinyl thing on the hi-fi system, et cetera, et cetera. There was no way that you could listen to music while you were jogging, for instance, because you would have to carry the hi-fi thing with you and, and then suddenly things would go wrong, as they are doing at the moment. Um, and so these uh, new music applications have arisen because we now have abundance of music. I'm sure it would be easier to get any piece of music on my, you know, to um, um, get the sound out uh, rather than the image uh, at this moment. So basically for 99 uh, cents, I think it's the same price in the US, right? Which is not fair because the euro is stronger. Um, <laughs> Hey, this is my, my browser, and these are my slides. And no, that's not what I wanted you to see. Yeah. Now, these applications have moved on from what I think you, you may know. Some of you may know that you can discover people through the music. Okay? There are quite a few plugins, for instance, for iTunes that will tell you, you should get in touch with so-and-so because you have a very similar taste. Um, or you can use your friend relationships, like in Twitter and Facebook and all, all that sort of stuff, to have your friends recommend things to you. Because maybe I should have explained that. Do you all know how Pandora and Last of Them work? Do you? There are basically two ways, two things that drive these sort of radio stations, right? Do you know what they are? Just chat. No, you don't. Okay, so very, it's actually very simple. One is it's a little bit like Amazon. One is just keeping track of everything you listen to, and then it compares you with all the other listeners, and it says, well, you're a little bit like the guy over there in Denmark, and the person over there in Ecuador, and a few other people, and so what they've also been listening to will now play for you. There's another technique, the first one, that's called social recommending. The other technique is based on the content. There is actually this thing called, the, not the human genome project, but the music genome project, where there's a lot of people that spend a lot of work trying to figure out what the important characteristics are of music. And then they describe music in, a great, you know, in great detail. We do that also in, in a spin-off company we created. We have dance teachers and DJs and those sorts of people sitting there all day listening to music and typing in what they think the music is all about. And then we use the characteristics of the music you listen to to figure out what kind of music you like. It's kind of simple, no? Okay. 
And so based on your listening behavior, we can also um, tell you that you should get you know, in touch with other people. Actually, there are now um, even commercially viable, a um, bit similar to the previous uh, presentation, commercially viable services that will do dating based on music. And I, I'm not sure what I think of it, but I do think it probably gives you a good topic to talk about on your first <laughs> date, right? At least you have music to talk about. Um, and in, in the, the, the work we do, we've driven this, this quite a bit further, and we can now take into account also your emotional state when we select music, okay? Um, and this is, again, a commercial product. This is not, you know, some far-fetched research idea or something like that. Um, you know, the, like the tool you see there, what you can do with that sort of thing is say, I want lazy summer evening barbecue music. And it will play. <laughs> and it won't stop ever until you tell it. <laughs> okay, your barbecue will be over far before this DJ gets tired. Okay. Um, actually, in the research, we're pushing this a little bit further. Now I'm talking more about the research stuff than the commercial applications. Um, in the research, what we're trying to do is to basically hook up your MP3 player to the sensors like the one that you see there that measure you know, the humidity of your hand palms and your heart rate and your breathing rhythm and that sort of thing and make reasonable, not perfect, but reasonable um, conclusions about your emotional state. And the way I think about it a little bit is, you know, we want to move beyond just playing music that you like. We want to move beyond playing music where you will occasionally go like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I haven't heard that for a while. That's, that's a good song. Now, we want to make your hair stand up. We want you to get goosebumps. That's the English word, I think, right, for this little, okay? <laughs> The way I think about it, it's the code name in my lab for this project, is it, we will turn your iPod into a crypod. We want to make you cry, okay? No less. And we really believe that, at least in certain conditions, we, we are getting there, okay? Now, here is what I would really want you to understand about how we do that. I believe that music is a very deep mystery. I believe we have no idea what makes, why my hair stands up. Why I start crying when I listen to certain music. It can be very, um, how would you say, um, it's not always, a, you know, you're not always in an appropriate context to cry. How do you call that? Um, it can be very um, embarrassing. That's the word I was looking for. Okay, at least I've learned something today and you should get a badge for uh, trying. <laughs> um, and, of course, as a sort of, you know, Science, scientist and interested in music, that's a bit sad news that we really can't figure out how that works because a lot of people have tried very hard to work on what is called strong emotional response if you want to have a look at the scientific literature. And so the sad news is we don't know. The good news is we don't have to know in order to build all these wonderful tools. And here is what I think is the good news is for learning. We don't have to understand how people learn to make this sort of thing work for learning too. Because frankly, I don't understand how people learn. I teach, but I don't understand how people learn. I learn, like I just learned the word embarrassing again, which was quite embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, you know, why did I forget that word? Why will that now stick with me for, I don't know, the next two minutes, 20, two years, 20 years, whatever. I don't know how that works. But again, we don't need to figure out how that works. And so what we've been, trying to do with a large group of people, including some present here, is we've been trying to create a Napster effect so that innovation will happen in learning in a similar way as it did in music, okay? So that we will build the equivalent of the crypot, but for learning, okay? Because that is where I think uh, we need to go. And I want to show you just three examples, but just to make sure, oh yes, and this is the group of people with whom we've been sharing all these resources so that we're creating abundance of learning resources. So this is our version of Napster, if you want. And it's still in its early stages, but uh, I actually did do a count a bit earlier today. We have slightly more than half a million objects in that globe network. They're all available 
uh, for you to use. So if you go to globeinfo.org, for instance, you can, you can figure it out. Um, and of course, there are other people doing similar things in the open educational resources arena. And the idea is to make sure that all of that gets interconnected in an abstract kind of way, okay? Um, so that we can build these innovative applications. And let me show you three examples, but begin by telling you that, and I'm sure that you figured that out already in your collab activities, that doing that sort of design of innovative tools on top of abundance of learning ma uh, materials is hard, okay? It's difficult, um, because we don't know how it works, really. We can figure out when it works and when it doesn't work, but we don't always, can't always predict, you know, whether it will work. And I have a short clip to illustrate that with something we haven't built, but that was built by people for whom I have, you know, the, the highest respect and who are really good at doing this sort of design, but they get it wrong from time to time as well. Um, here are these two very bright kids. They're mine, so they're really very bright. Um, because they're as bright as their mother. Okay. Um, and you know what they're holding in their hands, right? You recognize it? Okay, so you, you, you know that this is the $100 <laughs> laptop, and you know that there's been a lot of work done by people um, to get that laptop ready. A lot of the bright minds in our field have been involved in that project. And this is what happened when I was here in Half Moon Bay about a year and a bit ago, uh, visiting Lisa, and uh, my kids got their hands on, on this laptop. Um, basically, at the time, YouTube had a 10-minute upload limit, so this video continues for another nine minutes and a half or so. <laughs> and at the end of those 10 minutes, they've taken out the battery, they've done all sorts of things to the machine that you're not supposed to do, but they still haven't opened the machine. <laughs> this is a machine that was designed for kids like mine. Okay? There's another video that I will not show you of a very smart, elderly person, me, <laughs> doing the same thing with the laptop. I couldn't open a laptop. By the way, we have more laptops in our house than we have people, so it's not that they've never seen a laptop or anything. It's just that to do that design in a way that people just figure it out immediately is really, really hard, okay? So the only thing you can do is build something, try it out, figure out whether it works or not. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, too bad. Back to the drawing board, start a new learn from failure and move on, okay? So here's an example of something we've actually built together with a large group of people. This is, you know, many millions of euros of investment uh, behind it, also doing some of the, the basic research behind it. And this is what I think of as the sort of learning environment for architects of, what are we now, 2009? Let's say 2012 or something. Um, because we did this project together with a, a large number, 15 or 20 architecture schools in Europe, uh, where they train architects. Um, and basically what you see is students putting cards on a big table, and the table reacts by drawing the connections between the cards. The cards represent architects, architectural techniques, architectural styles. I know nothing about architecture, but the sort of thing architectural students need to know about, right? And so they're gathered around the table and they put this stuff on the table and the table responds to them and together they discuss also with their professor, um, you know, what this means and they learn from that. And this is an installation, by the way, that we did at uh, Architecture Biennale in, in, in Venice. Um, and we had lots of good response there. Here's another very short clip to show you something else that I think uh, lots of people are doing at the moment. This was together with colleagues in the Netherlands where we built a mobile interface on top of the same architecture information. What, happens, what you see on that screen is the same information that you saw on the big table before. But now I could walk around in Half Moon Bay, and I'm not sure about the buildings here, but if I was an architecture student, I could just point my device and it would respond with resources about architecture in Half Moon Bay. And so these are the sorts of applications that we're trying to design, and there's a lot of people doing similar things, to try and get that, crea uh, that innovation going um, in the learning space. This is sort of like trying to be the iPod of learning type of thing, right? And so to sum up, what I really hope we can 
make some progress on in the next few years, and uh, I know some of you are, are involved in that, is I think it's very important that we create that abundance of learning material, that we share our resources, so that we create a platform for innovation. And then we can go innovate. And the worst thing that can happen, what is the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing that can happen, I think, is, okay, maybe it won't work, but then at least we'll figure out why. And I think you guys are pretty comfortable with, with failure, right? So then we'll just learn from failure and move on. And that's all I wanted to say today. Thanks.